good word because we're coming into Govember. Go ahead, say that. Govember. Did you feel the spirit witness right there? Did you feel that? How many did feel that? You're going to feel it. We're going to get it figured out because I'm excited about Govember. I think forever it's going to be Govember. It is a new tradition at Impact Church that it will forever be Govember. And it's a really great time to go. It's a really great time to do that because with Christmas coming up and celebrating the incarnation, I tell you, there's something about that for sure. So I got a whole bunch of slides, so I hope Jonathan can keep up with me. I'm going to be pressing buttons, and hopefully he's pressing buttons too, but we're going to move. We're going to move. All right, we talked about worship. We're in a series, uh, and it's a series about uh, us, who we are, welcome home. And uh, so we're in that series, but we've been talking about worship. So last week we were saying worship is not a Christian thing, it's a human thing. You're all worshipers and you're world class. God designed you to be a worshiper. And we all worship. Everybody worships something. Everybody puts their energy, their time. You're designed to worship. You're world class. And the question isn't are you? The question is what are you worshiping? In John chapter 4, 21 to 24, this is really important right here. I want you to listen now. Jesus said to her, he's there with the Samaritan woman. He had to go through Samaria. Now, they despised Samaritans, the Jewish people. So his disciples were like, what are we doing over here? But he went there and he said, I have to go. He had to go through Samaria. And when he went there, he met this woman who was there in the middle of the day. And any woman who's drawing water in the middle of the day is there because she wants to be alone. She doesn't want to meet other people. It was a woman who'd had a difficult life. She'd been subject to many husbands and the one she was with now wasn't her husband. I mean, she may have been pimped out. It may have been a horrible, horrible life and a tragic, tragic life, but Jesus had to go through Samaria to be there to meet that woman. And when he was there, he was talking to her, and they started to talk about worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now listen to that. This is Jesus, and he's saying to her, I am telling you what's going to come. This is the prophet, the priest and the king prophesying. The prophet. Why would I ever believe something that the prophet said? Why would I embrace another prophet who doesn't agree with the prophet? This is the prophet prophesying at a well in Samaria. And he's saying to this woman, I'm telling you the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor will you worship in Jerusalem. There is a whole new worship system. It's not about your people and us people. It's not about where we worship. It's not about the place you worship anymore. Are you following me? It's not about that. He says, people are going to worship the Father. You worship what you don't know, but we know what we worship for salvation comes from the Jews. But, say but. The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, authentic, real worshipers, that's what God's looking for. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not going to be something that's done at a location or at a place. It's not some system where we have to come through courts and, and we have to have animal sacrifice and blood sacrifice. It's not some place where once a year one person gets to go into the presence of God. That system is going to be absolutely obliterated. We're not going back to this mountain and we're not going back to Jerusalem. A time is coming and now we is. When true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such worship, such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The prophetic words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let that sink in for a minute. Deeply. Let it sink in. So first of all, who was in charge of the worship service, the first worship service? Before, you know, the creation we exist in, who was running worship before? It was a fellow named Lucifer. And Lucifer, who he has lots of names, Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, the Devil, the Evil One, Sleuthfoot, call him whatever you will. I call him under my feet. That's what I call him. But he was an archangel. There were three archangels, but he was an archangel. And Isaiah 14, 11 says, Your pomp has brought you down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments. Say stringed instruments. Ezekiel 28, 13 says, The workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes. So Lucifer isn't some scary guy who comes out at Halloween with horns and a tail and chases you around. He actually, unbelievably beautiful instrument. Literally, the Bible says that when we step into eternity and we actually see the one who tormented everybody, we're going to say, 
that was the troublemaker? Are you kidding me? He was actually created as a beautiful musical instrument to lead worship. So there's three essentials for every orchestra. Every orchestra, there's three essentials. There's wind, there's percussion, and there's strings. There's wind and percussion and strings. You see, Lucifer was created. He himself possessed those. He was a beautiful musical instrument, a living being, an, an, an angel, yet he was created as a musical instrument, and he was covered. He was beautiful, covered with precious stones. But this archangel, he led a revolt, and a third of the angels revolted with him. Luke chapter 10, 18 says, I saw Satan, Lucifer, the devil. I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. I saw him, Jesus said, I saw him cast down. I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. Three archangels, three archangels, Gabriel. Gabriel's the one who announced the word of God. He's the one who would come and announce the word. He's the one who shows up and says, this is the word of the Lord. Then there was Michael. Michael is the one who engages with intercession and he engages with prayer. And then there was Lucifer. Lucifer was the one who expressed worship tangible worship. So those are the three basic elements of our gatherings. The basic elements are, are we have the word, we have prayer, and we express worship. And those are the things that take place. But Lucifer, the devil, he wanted the worship. He wanted the worship. He, he said, this is pretty good. Look what I'm doing. Man, oh, this is good. And Isaiah 14, 13 to 15 said, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit on the mount. I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the most high. And then he was brought low to show. And as soon as he had that proudful, horrible thing, and he tried to say, I will replace God. I will put myself above. As soon as he did that, he fell and he was cast out. So the devil wanted worship. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 16 says, you were the seal of perfection. You were in Eden in the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. He was created. He's not all-powerful. He was created. He has limited scope and limited ability. He was created for a purpose. He's been cast down. He is defeated. He does not have a leg to stand on. But he was there created beautifully by the abundance, listen, by the abundance of your trading. Say your trading. By the abundance of your trading, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. So his, his fall, his his. His, his sideways turn, his rebellion was because of the abundance of his trading. Not on the stock markets, uh, you know, not cards at the kiosk, but he's, what is, what's trading? You have to ask that question. Trading, what is trading? Trading, the word means merchandising. I want a cut of the transaction. It means a middleman. It means uh, I didn't, it didn't all get through the right place. So he took some. It's where I take a portion of it for myself. So in his trading, instead of all the glory going to God, he took some for himself. And he began to trade a little bit. He began to think, hey, it's all about me. And the, but it was the abundance of his trading. Pride entered in. Selfishness entered in. And the devil began to take some of the glory and he took more and more and he became proud and God cast him out of the presence of God. So the devil still, though, he, he still wants to worship. When, when the devil had not been defeated at the cross, crushed at the cross, the devil, when he was still in charge, he came and he tempted Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew 4, 9, and 10. He, he was tempting Jesus. He said, I'll give you a shortcut because I've got the ability. If you've come down here to, to take charge and to ex, ex, you know, establish your kingdom and to reign and to rule, if you want, it's mine. It was given to me, and I can give it to you. See, Adam gave. God gave Adam responsibility over all of creation, and Adam gave that responsibility to the devil. See, it was given to the devil. All authority, all power is given. He had it, and he said, I could give it to you, but you have to. Here's the exchange. If you worship me, I'll give you what you're looking for. He said, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Amen? So worship is service. I, I wrote this down the other day. I, I showed it to Kelly. I said, volunteering is something you do. Serving is an act of worship. 
So we got to change the volunteer thing. We got to, just in our, in our welcome home book, we have a whole thing on serving, and serving is, is worship. It's what we do. And you know, I, I said, you know, volunteering is, a, is, is something you do, but serving is an act of worship. If it feels like your work, if it feels like work when you're volunteering, it feels like work when you're volunteering, but it feels like worship when you're serving. We don't need volunteers. We are really looking for servants. We're looking. I don't want to. Do, oh, I got to go this Sunday. I'm on the greeting team. <laughs> Better show up. They'll know I'm not there this time. You know, I mean, if volunteering seems like work, I mean, that's it's not worship because worship is serving. Worship is what else can I do? Like, I mean, if, if you put me on the door one Sunday, could I, could I run, help Kelly with the kids another Sunday? I mean, can I, can I you know, clean up after? Can, can, I, can I get a key to the mop closet? Because, you know, it's, worship is invigorating. Worship and serving just gives you energy and gives you joy. Just thought I'd throw that in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Chet. <laughs> All right, so it's, it's who you serve. It's what you serve. All right. Number three here is we're the new worship program. We are. The devil got cast down. And you see, God has fixed it and established it that we are. And eternally, he always wanted it that way, that we, his children, would be the new worship program. Listen to this verse now. Listen, listen, listen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. I appeal to you how? I appeal to you and I appeal to you through something tangible, something real. I'm appealing to you and I'm appealing by the mercy of God. I'm appealing to you through the mercy of God. I'm appealing to you in light of a revelation of God's mercy. And he said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Spiritual worship is somebody who's been so captivated by the mercy of God that they yield their whole self. They surrender everything to God. And they say, all that I am, everything I do, every breath that I breathe, God, I dedicate it to you. Put me on like a garment. Live through me every moment of my life. That is real worship. Worship isn't what we do for a couple hours on Sunday. It's not a few songs. It's not raising our hands. I mean, that's all a part of the whole thing. But that's not why we gather. We don't gather to worship God. How are you? In light of the mercy of God. Well, you have to kind of think about that. We're going to look at that later because what does he mean? What's he appealing to? Now listen, God created some things and some things he made. Say created and made. He created some things and he made some things. To create means to form out of nothing. So God said, let there be light. And bang, there was light. I mean, it came out of nowhere. Literally, it says ex nihilo. There was nothing. There was total void, total chaos. And yet Jesus spoke into the void and he said, let there be light. And there was light. We have the same spirit of faith whereby we speak. And we can speak things that are not. And we can declare them as though they were there. And God brings them into manifestation. We can create with the words of our mouth things of God and purposes of God. Because he also made things. God said, let there be light. But he made things. He said, to fo- and to make is to form out of something. So some things are created out of nothing. But some other things were made out of something. Created out of nothing, made out of something. How many are enjoying this so far? All right, good, good. All right, so Genesis 1, 11, then God said, let the earth, so he spoke to the earth. So he didn't speak to nothing, he didn't create it, but he spoke to the earth, and he commanded something to be made out of something. So he commanded the earth, and he said, let the earth bring forth grass, and boom, there was grass. So we were created, we were created as beautiful instruments. We were created to be those worshipers. We got vocal cords. How many have ever seen your vocal cords? Yes, I, I went and had mine looked at. And uh, I, I, they put a camera down in my mouth and I could see the whole thing. And I was kind of, my doctor, my doctor's an interesting doctor, but, but she sends me all over the place whenever I go there. So, but she sent me to somebody because she didn't like the way my voice was sounding. 
I said, it's because I shout when I preach and I've been in foreign mission fields and sometimes I've preached three times a day and I'm shouting like a crazy man. And she said, well, you shouldn't do that. So she sent me and a guy put a camera on my vocal cords and he showed me that I had totally stressed out one end of my vocal cords. He said, your vocal cords just clapped together. And he says, man, you've been slamming them at the bottom end and you got to stop it. And so he, he gave me a reference to a voice coach so I could learn to speak in a way that I wouldn't damage my vocal cords. So isn't it amazing? Oh, God gave you cords. He's giving you strings, he's giving you, and then he's giving you breath to go through those strings. And that's one of the things about speaking is to breathe properly is really, really important. And then you got hands and feet, right? So you got percussion, right? Oh, back Betty, scramble down. Oh, it was on the playlist. I don't even know what happened. Clap your hands, all you people shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all you people shout unto God with a voice of praise. Hosanna, Hosanna, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Praise him, praise him, shout unto God with a voice of praise. Woo! How many remember that song? You're really old, oh my God. <laughs> Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath. Ha! Wow. Man, settle down. Just bring it back down. You know? Wow. So when God wanted to make something, he spoke to where he wanted it to come from. He created things out of nothing. But when he wanted to make something, he spoke to where it or what it, he wanted it to come from. To come from. It came from something. It was sustained by that same thing and it returned to the same thing. So things that are made come from somewhere, they're sustained by that, and they also return to us. So the earth, he spoke to, and he said, do this. And whatever the earth was told to do, it did it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, and the herbs, and the yield the seeds, and the fruit trees, and yield fruit according to its kind, whose seeds in itself on the earth. Tree comes from dirt, the tree is sustained by the dirt, and the tree returns to dirt. Wow, this is really good stuff, Pastor. It's good stuff. Tree comes from dirt. It's sustained by the dirt, and it returns to dirt. All right, Genesis 1, verse 20. Then he said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures. So fish and all those things, they, he spoke to where they came from, and he called them forth in the realm of where they came from. Fish come from water. They're sustained by water. They return to water. You ever heard, you're like a fish out of water. You know why? Because that's not natural. It's not natural to be a fish out of water. You're supposed to be in the realm that you were created from, called from, because wherever you've been called from is where you're sustained from. Deep stuff, amen? Deep, deep stuff. Genesis 1, Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind. So the cow came from the earth to sustain by the earth and returns to the earth. The cow eats salads, chews up salads, and then it gives us Rocky Road ice cream. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. My wife's in a relationship with two men, Tom and Jerry. <laughs> she loves that ice cream. I don't know what's going on there, I'll tell you. Cow came from the earth, sustained by the earth, but it returns to the earth. Now listen, we come from God. I did all of that just to get you here. We come from God. We come from God. Everything else was, you know, came from something, was out of something, but we're so unique because we come from God. I'm a child of God. I belong to God. We come from God. Then God said, let us make man, not create, but let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Man is a spirit. He came from God. God sustains. We are sustained by God, and we will return back to God. See, we came from God, created to be these beautiful instruments of worship, to manifest God, to display, to love Him and enjoy His love. We came from Him. We are totally, you are to be completely, totally sustained by God. What should sustain you every moment of your life? God. Every breath I breathe, everything I do, God. You are the source of my life. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never experience fullness of life if you're taken out of the environment that you came from. We came from God. 
Everything works best in your life when you live out of and are sustained by. He is every breath that I breathe. And when you know that, you say, yes, man is a spirit. He came from God. He's sustained by God. He returns back to God. Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground. So my body came from the ground. My body came from the ground. You see, I'm, I'm not this body. This body is just a container. If you lose the container, your spirit goes to heaven. That's the way it is. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, But your body was created from this realm. So man was formed out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. My body was made from the earth. It's sustained by the earth. And often McDonald's as well helps, helps with that. Especially when my wife's away. It's amazing. Praise God for drive throughs and now I'm going to replace the kitchen with a drive through window just to make it easier. You know, so. Sustained by the earth, and it will return to the earth. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But you see, that's not me. This is just that little earth suit that God gave me. And this earth suit's going to glorify God. This earth suit's going to serve the eternal purpose of God. This earth suit's never going to quit on the divine purpose of the Spirit of God that's in me. God created me to do great things. And this earth suit has no right or authority to back away, back down, or come off of the purpose of God in my life. I don't live by the strength of this world. It's the resurrection power of God. The resurrection power of the Spirit of God quickens my mortal body. This soma, this meat sack, it's created to honor God. I don't feel like getting up. Shut up and move it. We're going. I'm too tired to go to church. Hey! Smarten up over there. Okay, it's good. All right. Let's go on. If anything that was made from something tries to remove itself from what it comes from, it will die. If anything that was made from something tries to remove itself from what it came from, it will die. It's like Dylan's beautiful little pickle plant I had here the other day. If I had pulled the pickle plant out of the ground, it would die. And that's like some people. You keep pulling yourself in and out of fellowship. You keep pulling yourself in and out of living community. And you're wondering why you can't seem to gain any traction. You know, you're, you're planted in, the, in a community. God has set each one in the body of Christ as he desires. It so breaks my heart that half the believers today, it says half the believers today don't attend a local church. It breaks my heart. I mean, my goodness, I love church. Who loves church? Three people. <laughs> I, mean, I love church. If you take yourself out of that environment, it says it will die. Genesis 1, 17, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. When you want to see, that was the sin. The beginning was uh, there's a tree of life, and then there was the tree of the knowledge of good. The knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge, the tree of knowledge. You see, when we eat of the tree of knowledge, and the devil lied to them and said, God is holding out on you. There's more. There's way more. He's holding out on you. So suddenly they're going, Am I going to live out of everything that proceeds from the mouth of God, or am I going to listen to this dumb snake who's talking to me? They listen to the serpent, and they, they, they're deceived in the thinking that I can live independently of God. In fact, God's holding out on me. There's more to life than just hanging out with him. And so they decided to eat of the knowledge of good and evil. And man is drunk on the knowledge of good and evil today. That's why we fight about politics all the time. That's why we fight about, you know, and some of you people are not Leafs fans. I don't know what your problem is. Grow up. Yeah. But see, we, we get into judgment I judge you. You know, you're not acceptable at our church. You don't behave the way we want behavior. We don't esteem you as, as good enough to be in our community. That's judgment. That's, that's eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're putting people in, in silos, in places. You see, that's judgment. It's the knowledge of good and evil. And you see, it's selfish. It's saying, God, you don't have to make the call. I'll call this one out. They don't belong. You know, God says, I love them all. I want them all. If you don't mind, shut up over there. You ever heard of the unconditional love of God? Wow, that one still bends my head. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. What they said was, we are going to pull ourselves out of what we came from. We're going to remove ourselves from God alone being the source of everything in our life. And we're going to start determining stuff on our own. And as soon as you do that, boom, you will surely die. 
So what we had there was not, not a physical death because they were still alive. The sad thing is, is they went and hid and God was looking for them. God was pursuing them. See, sin didn't separate them from God. Sin caused them to have a, a mental breakdown. I mean, them choosing to live and, and to reject God's word, it caused shame and guilt and fear. It caused their conscience to become broken. And you see, they became afraid of God. They then, in their knowledge, in our estimation, God's going to be really ticked off with us right now. I'm going to go hide from him. See, when you live out of your concept of God, you're going to run away from him. But God is nuts about you, loves you, and he's never going to change his mind about you no matter what. But they went and they hid from the kindness and goodness of God and God, hello, where are you? Not that I don't know where you are, but I'm giving you a chance to come out of that stupid bent that you're in. But they chose to live out of that. And so God had to separate them from the garden. He had to separate them from the tree of life. And he put two cherubim there. But the beautiful thing is the, the, the holy of holies was separated by two cherubim. And when Jesus' blood was shed, the veil was broken, the cherubim are gone. We have access to the tree of life. We're restored in Jesus' name. No more spiritual death. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. There is a playlist on Spotify for this sermon. So it's there. Ephesians 2, 1, he has made us alive who were dead in transgresses and sins. We're never dead to God. We're dead in our own dumbed down situation. John 10, 10, I have come that you might have life, the very Zoe, the life of God, and you might have it more abundantly. If anything that was made from something tries to remove itself from something, it will die. All right. Worship. Worship. What is worship, Pastor? Worship is absolutely yielding to God. Worship isn't what we do on Sunday mornings. We come together, we gather, we have a song service. We don't gather to worship, even though we say worship service or we do that. You know, that's not what it's all about. This isn't worship. It's great. Praise is powerful. The dynamics do incredible things for you, in you, and through you. But this isn't worship. Worship is every moment of your life, yielding your life to God. Romans 12, 1 again, Therefore I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Boom. I keep on going the wrong way. All right, let me go back then, because it had a therefore. See, therefore. Therefore, you know, if you see a therefore, what do you do? You find out what it's? Exactly. So if there's a therefore, it means it's connected to what was in it previously. So therefore, chapter 12 is connected to chapter 11. So if it says, in light of the mercies of God, therefore, in light of these mercies, I have to go back to the last chapter and find out what mercy was he talking about? So you go back to chapter 11, you'll find it. Chapter 11, Romans 11, 28 and 32. It says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. And this benefits you. The fact that they rejected Jesus and were enemies of the good news, they wanted a king who would come and, and raise them up and obliterate all their enemies. But, but this guy who dies for us, we reject that. But you see, them rejecting the good news benefits you. Yet, they are still the people of God and he loves them because they are chosen ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gift and his call can never be withdrawn once you, the Gentiles, were rebels against God. Once you guys were rebels against God. Once you were rebels against God. But when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now what I'm reading here is the Bible. good to read I wish people would read their Bibles more sadly we got so much access to information we listen to all kinds of stuff on YouTube and Facebook and all kinds of places but when you read your Bible it's all pretty clear it just demands a wee bit of literacy and even if that's not there ask the Holy Spirit to help you the divine teacher will come and he will lead you into all truth all truth but read your Bible God was merciful to you instead now they are the rebels and God's mercy has come to you so that they too will share in God's mercy so God's mercy came to the Gentiles after the Jews rejected it but the mercy of God came to the Gentiles why so that they too will share in God's original program for them of Jerusalem Remember back in John 4 when Jesus said there's coming a time and now is when you're not going to worship at this mountain nor will you worship at Jerusalem. That was 
a religious cow, just kind of fell over. They too will share in God's mercy, for God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience. Say everyone. What is he talking about? He's talking about two groups of people. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Hebrews says, or, or Ephesians says, the wall of separation is broken down. There's now one way. Jesus is the new and living way. There's only one name under heaven by which man can be saved. Jesus is Lord of all. See, Jesus did all of this. God's mercy was manifest so that everyone could be put into one big lump. Every single person, excluding no one, were put into one big lump because it was always God's plan that I'm going to have a relationship with you, not through works, not through structures, not through, you know, blood sacrifices, not through any other nonsense, not through any other mediator except Jesus himself. Every one of you were grouped over here so that by one foul swoop, I could show mercy to all mankind. So every one of us come to God one way, not through works so no one can boast Jesus and the gift of his grace and by faith is how we have a relationship with God. We saw the mercy and in light of the mercy of God, we have responded and said, I want to serve you with my whole life. And we worship God. True worship is rooted in mercy. True worship is rooted in mercy. By the mercy of God, we have all been given access to the New Covenant worship program. Say, New Covenant? What covenant are we in right now? New Covenant. What did the Bible say about the Old Covenant? It says the Old Covenant is now obsolete. Amen? How many of you have ever worked on computers with just the DOS platform? See that hand? See that? How many have no idea what the DOS platform is? See, I remember my cousin, she was saying she just got Windows. I just put Windows on my computer. It's made life so easier. I said, ah, it's a fad. <laughs> Windows. I got DOS. I don't mind. I can run DOS. I don't need somebody to program and set a whole bunch of shortcuts up for me. I know how to run my computer. And I thought Windows was a fad. Boy, about a year later, I said, oh, thank God for Windows. Now I can't stand Windows. I'm a Mac guy. <laughs> Give it up for Apple. Woo! If you're not on Apple, there's two types of people. Apple people, woo! And the rest of you. So anyways. You know what? Nobody works off the DOS platform anymore because it's obsolete. But there's some people still trying to exalt God, worship God. They're still trying to do the old system. And Jesus said, there's a new day that has come. Now, people do not worship in a location, but they have become living stones. I habitate them. They are the new worship program. And you worship God everywhere you go. You don't worship God for two hours on Sunday. You worship, Sarah worships while she's cutting hair. Cutting hair is an act of worship. She uses her creative skills and ability to craft people's hair and do amazing things. And then I have to remember to tell my wife, you look awesome. You just came back from... Please, men, do that. It's important. I've missed it a couple times. It's like... Anyway. But everything you do, whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord because my whole life, everything I do, God puts me on like a garment. Everything I do is an act of worship. By the mercy of God, we entered into the new program, the eternal purpose of God is realized. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, it says, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, in whom you are being built together as the dwelling place of God by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You are not your own. You are not your own. You are the temple of God. You are the holy dwelling place of God Almighty. You got one choice. Lord, take me, use me today. Every breath I breathe, everything I do, let it be glorifying to you. That's worship. For you were bought with a price and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You came from God, you're sustained by God, and you return to God. The moment of your life where you choose that I will sustain myself, I will make choices for myself, I will choose what to do with my own life, big fella. The minute you do that, you've pulled yourself out of the environment that sustains you. Every day you were created to live and breathe and be a worship expression of God in everything. I mean, Kristen is, is boxing for the homeless. 
She's going to punch a lady out in the glory of God. She is training to make sure she beats the snot out of somebody. She's getting a tattoo, Philippians 3, 14. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Have one of these. But you know, you can do all of that and give glory to God. You can do everything you're doing. You can, you can honor God. You can honor God when you're going through the drive through You can honor God by paying for the person behind you. you. You can honor God by all of your life being generous and looking for places to express, I am a child of God. Thank you very much. Try and say, God, speak through me today. I need your help. Philippians 3, 3 says, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. See, that's, that's real, true religion. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. No confidence in human effort. We don't gather for worship. We are a gathering of worshipers. We don't gather for worship. We are a gathering of worshipers. We don't get together and go, Come on, everybody, let's work really hard. Let's, let's try to get God to come. Are you ready? Let's get them. Let's get them. Let's get God in this place. That's not what worship people do. Worship people just help you realize, hey, guys, God's here. We don't have to drum it up. We came. We're flooded. We're saturated with God. We're a gathering of worshipers. So, so if that's not what it's about, Pastor, I mean, what are we doing? So worship is everyday life, but our gatherings are for edification and that does include the word singing and encouragement, but our gatherings are to bless each other and to encourage each other. We don't gather just so once a week we can, you know, get God's whammy on our lives. I mean, worship is something I do every single moment of my life. But this gathering is where as worshipers we gather, we encourage each other, we bless each other, we share with each other, we inspire each other. People are edified and equipped for ministry. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, how is it then, brethren? When you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, and let all things be done. When you gather together, everyone hath the something. I remember every once in a while, Sunday nights, Sunday night services, when I was too lazy to get two sermons from the Lord. Remember those Sunday night meetings? How many miss those Sunday night meetings? Not enough. So, I felt so guilty when we stopped Sunday nights. I would sit there on the couch and say, what's wrong with you? I'm disobedient to God. I, man, I, I, haven't, I haven't not been in a Sunday night service since, since I don't even know when felt horrible. I would go visit other churches just so I said, God, look, I'm here. The people you gave me are disobedient and evil, but I'm here. But sometimes on Sunday night, it was hard to, it was hard to be good twice on a Sunday. You know, you had to preach midweek. I was teaching at a Bible school. Then I was, you know, teaching twice at a Bible school. Then I was preaching twice on Sunday. I'd, I'd be teaching five or six times a week. And sometimes, some Sunday nights, it just was too hard to be good again. And the people are so demanding. So, you know, I said, tonight we're going to have a half a service because everyone half of something. So instead of just me trying to get something, we're all going to come with something. So tonight's a half a meeting. Amen. How many don't love a half a meeting where we come, we just begin to worship and then boom, boom, boom. It's not just Wayne coming up with something. It's the whole fellowship just moving together, edifying, encouraging, blessing, speaking to each other. Woo! See, you know, when we gather together, it's not to try to get God to come bless us. It's to as the blessed people of God to come and encourage each other, to speak to each other, to encourage each other. One comes, you see them down. Hey, what's going on? You talk to them. You always come. You always come to church with $100 in your pocket. Always. And then you say, Lord, who needs this? Sarah's laughing at me. I don't know why. You know, you should always be prepared to be a blessing. You know, sometimes if somebody comes to you with a need, you know what? You're the answer to that. You know, we're in a community where we want to be blessed, we want to be helpful. And when we come, it's not so we can sing songs and I'll go, hey, George was good today, hey? Eh? It is good that George is good, and it is good that through the songs we're edified and we enjoy ourselves, but that's not worship. Worship is what you're doing every day. And when we gather, it's to equip each other, to bless each other. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything you do is done through God and whatever. Say whatever. Whatever. 
Whatever, whatever you do, everything in word and in deed, do it as unto the Lord. Let's go to Romans 12.1 one more time. Romans 12.1. So here's what I want you to do. This is from the message. So, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, place it before God as an offering. So here's what I want you to do. In the light of the mercy of God, he's brought us all disobedient, grouped us all in the one big disobedient mess. So by one act of his mercy, he could call us all to be sons and daughters of God by faith. Now what do I want you to do in light of that mercy? I want you to take your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, your walking around life, put it before God. Say, I worship you, almighty God, in everything I do. Go across the hall to your neighbor like Hermano's neighbor knocked on the door. Hi, welcome to the neighborhood. I'm a man of God. My family serves God. I go to church. You need to come with me. Well, yes, of course I will come. And then Yasmin's going, well, what's the deal? I've been asking you for years. Why aren't people coming to church? Because you're not worshiping. Oh, I'm worshiping, Pastor. Didn't you hear me today? You're a great God. The worship is when you take your everyday life and you walk around and everywhere you are, people see a demonstration of his life and then they knock on your door and say, take me to your leader. <laughs> take that everyday life, that ordinary life, that sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life. Place it before God as an offering. We are the new worship program. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us.